Find an address. 2433 North Lincoln Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. How long has it been since you guys have been in Chicago? Too long. I visited once many years ago. Hi, Brad. Hey, guys, I'm guessing you're close to Chicago, the city where many believe the American mob was born. Of course, that was about 100 years ago, back when mobsters wore fedoras and slung Tommy guns, which is very different than what the mob looks like these days. I thought they got all the bad guys. According to sources like the FBI and the DEA, the mob is up to a very different game these days. And from what they're telling me, one that puts us all at risk. So if it's changed, we need to get a lock on what exactly the mob looks like here in the 21st century to find out what they're up to, how it's changed from the past, and what they target today. Hey, Brad, should we be worried that uh, we could get whacked? <laughs> I wouldn't be laughing so hard if I were you. Don't forget, you're the ones going after the mob. I have to tell you, the mob is on my list of people not to bother. Chicago was the, um, the sort of the uh, raison d'etre, if you will, of organized crime during Prohibition. That's why all those movies made in the early 1930s are not so much set in New York someplace, they're set in Chicago. We had um, a virtual citywide gang war here at one time, which you didn't have in most other cities. You had very, very spectacular violence. We've all seen news stories of mob violence, but for some of the most spectacular violence, it took place right here at Chicago's Biograph Theater, where gangster John Dillinger was gunned down. Dillinger robbed 24 banks, escaped jail twice, and he raided four police stations. Most crooks flee the cops, but when Dillinger's men needed supplies, he brought them straight to the police arsenals to steal ammunition, machine guns, and bulletproof vests. On July 22, 1934, J. Edgar Hoover's team of federal investigators tracked Dillinger to the biograph. And you know what he watched? What else? A gangster movie. Agents were waiting while he exited, and although they reportedly called for his surrender, Dillinger wanted to shoot it out. He was shot three times, and at 10.50 p.m., John Dillinger was pronounced dead. John, law enforcement calls the mob organized crime. How does the organization work, and what's the hierarchy look like? Um, the, the basic setup is there's a boss, there's an underboss who reports directly to the boss, carries out the boss's orders, then there are street crews, if you will, each run by the term in East Coast would be a capo, and then there's guys inside the crew's East Coast terminology, a soldier. The group that's dominated organized crime in Chicago and the surrounding area for years, the Chicago Outfit, its roots go all the way back to basically 1900 before Prohibition. Al Capone gets and becomes the Capone Gang during Prohibition. In 1920, the 18th Amendment made the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors illegal. This brought on a dramatic decrease in alcohol consumption and a dramatic increase in organized crime. And there was no bigger name in organized crime than Alphonse Gabriel Capone. Al Capone was born in Brooklyn and moved to Chicago in his 20s, where he quickly rose to the top spot of the city's most notorious gang, The Outfit, and the top spot on the FBI's most wanted list. I was under the impression that organized crime in Chicago died with Al Capone. Nothing could be further from the truth, although people like Elliot Ness, etc., declared it dead in 1932, but they were just a little bit off base on that. Um, they're still around today, but they're harder to see, they're harder to pin down. What do they have left to mess with if there's no prohibition? Gambling, some labor racketeering, some prostitution, and uh, business racketeering, juice lending, things like that. Organized crime is here and will always be here. As long as there's a public demand for something that's illegal, someone will supply it. Al Capone is to organize crime, what Thomas Jefferson is to American politics, a founding father. So if we want to understand exactly what the mob is today, we first need to understand where it came from. Was Al Capone a mobster? Yes, he was a mobster. Was he a monster? No, he was not a monster. What's the significance of the Green Mill with your uncle? Uh, the Green Mill was purchased uh, by my uncle, so it really takes me back in time when I come in here. This was the booth that Al reportedly sat in every time he came in here. But it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, he can see the door and he can see, see the most, door, most right of there. the people in here. Yep, yeah. Absolutely. Deirdre, you actually met Al Capone and you sure. remember him. He taught me to swim in his pool in, in Florida. 
helped me learn to ride a bike, taught me the mandolin. Yeah, we were a very, very close family. Was he, was Al Capone an emotional guy? I very. Mean, he wasn't just a heartless killer that no. we think of him? No, he was very emotional. If he saw a child hurt or hungry, he would cry. If he saw a, a, a you know, an animal suffering, he would cry. Deidre knew Al Capone the loving family man, but Al Capone the mobster was cutthroat, deadly, and ruthless. When a mayor he had put into office announced he was going to put Capone away for good, Capone threw him down the steps of town hall. And Capone was said to have been responsible for one of the bloodiest days in Chicago, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Capone reportedly had his men dress up like the Chicago police and then gun down seven of his rivals. But he would never be prosecuted for this or for bootlegging. So what finally sent Al Capone to Alcatraz? You know this one, tax evasion. How did the legacy of the outfit come to be? You know, the United States government decided to um, outlaw alcohol. People wanted alcohol. That's what the Capone outfit did. If you take the Rockefeller family, the Kennedy family, and the, the Capone family, the origins and the beginnings are all exactly the same. Al Capone said, if I am guilty of breaking the law, then my customers are as guilty as I am. Al said, when I serve alcohol, it's called bootlegging. But when the people on North Shore serve it, it's called hospitality. Wow. Right. In, in your mind, is the uh, organized crime of today scarier and more dangerous than it was yes. under Al Capone? To me, yes, I think it is. Because there's no accountability. There's no honesty left anymore. They can affect a lot more people in a lot broader area. The organized crime that, you know, my family was involved in was very regional, very small, very community. That old adage, honor among thieves, really fit with what the Capone outfit was doing. Deidre is clearly remembering a time when not everybody saw good fellas as bad guys. So imagine it's prohibition and you want a few bottles of wine for your wedding. Or it's the Great Depression and no bank will give you a loan for your small business. Your local wise guy could get these things for you. Sure, if you didn't pay them back, it was baseball bats versus kneecaps. But many of them kept their word and if you didn't mess with them, they didn't mess with you. I was raised that your word is your bond and family is everything. And that's exactly how that organization ran. They were a family. You knew what was expected of you. If you broke the rules, there had to be some punishment for it. And that's the way that it was. What else was involved in their code? I mean, I've heard, and I don't know if it's true, that uh, women and children are off limits, for example. Absolutely. For family is off limits. Mm -hmm. um, you you know, I can guarantee that no innocent person was ever hurt when the Capone boys ran things in Chicago. Deirdre isn't just waxing nostalgic about Uncle Al. This was the sacred code by which the mob lived and died. In 1981, L.A. mob boss Jimmy Fratiano entered witness protection and earned his nickname, The Weasel. He squealed on the inner workings of the mafioso, including the secret mafia initiation ritual. It dates back two centuries to Sicily and is referred to as a second baptism. Your trigger finger is pricked and your blood is spilled onto the picture of a saint. The picture is then lit on fire while you recite, as burns this saint, so will burn my soul if you betray the mafia. And you're asked if you would kill your brother to protect its secrets. In fact, when people use the word sub rosa to mean clandestine, this is a reference to the mafia's fanatical secrecy. It means under the rose and comes from the practice of hanging a rose over a door when secret meetings were underway. But when the weasel snitched, he revealed the mafia's three secret vows. One, never mess with women or children. Two, never mess with drugs. And three, never snitch. If the outfit were still operating, wouldn't they be operating in narcotics? Because that's today's prohibition. My grandfather saw the things changing in the 50s, and he, he told me that people were losing honor, and the honor was disappearing. And he also saw the influence of drugs and wanted nothing to do with that. But I do know that my family would have nothing to do with narcotics at all.
Al Capone would be appalled at what some people are calling gangs today. Deirdre, if we're looking further into organized crime today, where would you suggest that we look? I'm not an expert on Whitey Bulger, but he was involved in organized crime, and he was on, what they say, on the lam for years. Whitey Bulger was the former head of Boston's Irish mob. And if it was illegal and you can make a buck doing it, Whitey Bulger did it. If anyone was a next generation Al Capone, it was Whitey, who was recently arrested. So this is who Buddy Mac and Scott need to look into if we want to find out what does the mob really look like today.